Hey readers and writers, I'm Adrian Buskey, and you're listening to Fictitious, a podcast about the storytelling craft of science fiction and fantasy. My guest this episode is Katie Rose Poole, debut author of the young adult fantasy novel There Will Come a Darkness. It's a world shaped by seven great prophets who, after a 2,000-year reign, vanished a century ago. Now their secret and final prophecy is coming to fruition, and with it comes an age of darkness. Amidst chaos and conflict, five young people from wildly different backgrounds are pulled together to fulfill unexpected roles in their prophecy, to either save their world or irrevocably break it. A Fierce Reads title, There Will Come a Darkness, arrives September 3rd from Henry Holt and Company. And Katie, welcome to Fictitious. Hi, thank you for having me. This is your debut work, right? That is correct. Have you done any other published work? I mean, any kind of like short story work or anything like that? None whatsoever. I actually find short stories very difficult to write. I have never successfully like written one that I'm like proud of. (laughs) So yeah, this is my first published anything. That's infuriating because this is so good. (laughs) So for you coming out the gate as a debut author with something that feels this strong and this polished is really, really impressive. I was struck right out of the gate when I when I started reading it at how clearly the characters come across, like how well the pacing moves and how you're very judicious about how you dole out the information about this world so that we have just enough to keep it moving. And then you're always developing information out in the background, even though the characters and their plights are first and foremost. And I want to really dig into all of those things from a craft perspective. But just kind of starting off, I would like to hear more about the story, what it's about and what this world is about in your own words. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I think you gave a really great overview. Essentially, the whole book is framed by this prophecy that's about to unfold. And it involves five characters lives. And really, the story started with these characters. And so we have a prince who has been exiled from his kingdom. We have a boy who is basically like a gambler who's been on the run from something from his past. We have a girl who is essentially a murderer, but she's murdering to keep her sister alive. And then we have this person who's about to become in charge of this order that knows about the last prophecy. And so he's really the only character of the point of view characters who knows about this last prophecy. And he's the one who's coming to sort of try and find the last prophet who is part of this prophecy and stop the age of darkness that it predicts. In watching sort of like the YA market, for years, I felt like you would see most of the prevalent YA novels had usually one protagonist, usually first person perspective. Occasionally, you would get like two different heads to follow in it. In the last couple of years, I think we've seen a little bit more of a trend into seeing more POVs. In particular, I mean, very notable, you know, you have Six of Crows from Lee Bardugo or things like Gilded Wolves. And, uh, And so I think we've seen a little bit more movement here. For me, in a lot of ways, this book reads very much like epic fantasy in the sense that you do have those multiple POVs, you do have this complex world. And even though I think I just saw the map for it because my arc doesn't have the map, but I just saw it online. It's the coolest. (laughs) Yeah, it's very, very cool. But it also gives that sense that this is really kind of a story wrapped on like a continent wrapped around a sea in the sense that there's probably a much very larger world outside of it. So even though the story feels very, very big, it's centered in a a fairly small section of a world. But again, it has that epic fantasy feel, but at the same time has that sort of emotional core in its sleeve element that I think we recognize in a lot of YA. I mean, so first off, I, w- I want to know, like, what was the original genesis of this story? Like, when you were first really coming up with this, where did this come from? And did you know always that it was going to be focused on YA? And, and what kind of other story structures were influencing that concept? Yeah, this is a great question. And I like that you brought up the fact that, you know, a while ago, there really wasn't a lot of multiple points of view in fantasy, in YA fantasy, I mean. And I was writing this book during that time, actually. So I had started writing this book in like 2014. And this was sort of like, I think the tail end of like the dystopian YA kind of stuff. So I didn't really see a place for the book in YA, although I had these characters who were very YA aged. And I think my writing reads very like young adult. Um, So when I first started writing this book, I was like, this is a fantasy book. I'm going to query it just as a fantasy book, not young adult. Um, And that's how I actually ended up querying the book. And for me, like, I really did just want to tell like a really big story with a lot of characters and like a really epic scope and epic stakes stuff that influenced me definitely like Game of Thrones was one of them I started reading that series when I was like probably too young to be reading that series (laughs) like a little questionable but that sort of thing and then I think I was also influenced by a lot of actually like television shows and television shows do tend to have that sort of like multiple points of view like even if there's one protagonist 
we get these scenes from like other characters and we get to know them really well. So I think that was also an influence that I was like, well, I don't want to just focus on this one character. I want to have a lot of characters who the reader can care about and who can sort of offer different perspectives about this like big epic story. I like that you mentioned the TV element on there because there was something that I noticed as I was going through where there was uh, certain places where, particularly as some of these characters get introduced to each other or first come in contact, there are scenes that I think of, in my head, I call it the CW switch. And the reason why, I, <laughs> maybe you know what I mean right off the bat, what I mean for this, you see this in, in every type of show that has a lot of different characters and a lot of big emotional beats. But in particular with CW shows aimed at teens, there's a lot of these moments where you get these high tension, two characters having a big tense moment together, and it usually gets fairly awkward, and then the scene cuts away. And so we don't necessarily have to see the denouement of that conversation as people go, uh, well, I guess maybe I'll put my pants back on and leave or whatever. <laughs> You know, we get just what we need to get that tension and, and we move away from it. And again, very prevalent in a lot of TV. But in particular, I feel like those kind of teen focused shows on the CW have it down to a science. And there were moments in this where I was like, oh, that's a CW switch. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> like cutting to a new character. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah, yeah. You know, you said like you were getting those kind of influences stuff when you were first thinking about it. What came first with this world? Were you thinking about the characters first with a concept? You have a pretty uh, interesting magic system that we'll talk about in a little bit, too. But where did it all kind of start? It was absolutely character first for me. Um, I think many of my projects tend to be this way, although I not all, of course. But for this book in particular, like I had these characters, I had their individual storylines. And what I didn't have was how those storylines were all connected. So that was sort of a process of figuring that out. But to be honest, like I knew a lot about the characters from the very beginning of writing this book. And then the other piece of it that I did know was the magic system. Not really anything about like the prophets and the prophecy necessarily, but I knew about the graces and what they did and sort of how they influenced the world. So I guess it'd be a good point then to talk about the graces here and what that magic system is, because as opposed to having a world where people are like, oh, I'm a wizard or, you know, that kind of stuff. What you have here is people who are imbued with this particular ability or a set of like the what there's like four different graces, right? Yeah. And they are things that the prophets have bestowed on lineages of people. And then they just sort of emerge kind of randomly. Can you kind of explain what that system is, how the graces work and how it affects people's place in the world? Essentially, the magic system is built around a central concept of like, it's a pretty common concept, I think, in a lot of cultures, like a sort of sacred energy that flows throughout the world. So in my magic system, basically, there are these four different ways of manipulating this energy. They sort of like manifest in these different graces. So the grace of heart, for instance, the person who sort of wields that grace uses sacred energy to make themselves like stronger, faster, better senses. The grace of blood can actually manipulate that energy by taking it from people and giving it to people so they can heal people. They can also kill people. And then the grace of sight, you sort of have the ability to sense this energy as a whole. And so these people can find people just by basically knowing their name. Um, they could seek out like the energy of that person and find them. And to be honest, I don't really know like where I came up with all of this, but it was definitely there from the very like beginning was like this particular magic system. And I think it's similar to some magic systems in that, you know, only some people can wield it, but it's not like, for instance, like an elemental magic system, like in like Avatar The Last Airbender or the Grisha series. So I was sort of wanting some of the elements of that, but also have a unique spin on it. Um, and then in this world, the people with these graces are often in positions of power. So we see, for instance, like a family who has ruled the kingdom of Herat, like they have had grace throughout their entire lineage. So we sort of see that this rare ability that people have does give them actual power in the world. And then we have this other group of people who basically don't want these graced people to continue to exist. I thought that was a really a fascinating idea for this villain who's kind of hovering in the background for a lot of the story. You know, you're hearing about these things like he has taken over one of these sacred cities. He has amassed followers. He has basically called the teachings of the prophets of the past fake news. And he's like, all these people who have been blessed with these graces are now abominations and we need to burn this out of them. And, and this is part of what the prophecy is all about. And I, I thought it was interesting to take a world where you've got people who are blessed by these things and it's always been this core part of their culture. And now you've got somebody coming in and saying it's anathema and that they need to be stopped. It was like a reversed X-Men 
I don't know if you're if you're a comics fan or an X-Men person at all. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So like, you know, with X-Men, it's always like mutants have all these powers and people hate them for it and they're hunted for it. And in this world, you have these people who have always been revered for having this thing. It's a, this blessing upon them. And now suddenly that's kind of being reversed. That is a really interesting way to look at that. Thematically, what were you playing with here when you were thinking about it? I mean, clearly, like the emotions of the characters and, and there's a number of personal things that we'll talk about later that affect these individual characters. But overall, were there thematic structures that you were thinking about as you were putting this whole story together? I don't think there was a particular conscious theme that I was trying to get at with making this sort of the villain and making the world the way that it was. But I did find something very interesting about the idea of like, obviously, there were these prophets, but they're gone now. And it's been 100 years since they were helping to guide the world. And so the sort of question of like, what would happen in the wake of these prophets, how would the world react to this sort of loss of faith that they all have? Um, and I think the idea of someone sort of turning around and saying, you know what, these prophets were never great, the graced are not great. And actually, we need to like completely transform the way that the world is, was an interesting question for me. Like, I think that that makes a lot of sense. And then there's sort of an apocalyptic element to it too, because I've always just been interested in these sort of times throughout history that people have felt like the apocalypse was coming. And I think we certainly feel that to some degree now. And again, that wasn't something I was consciously trying to tap into, but certainly came out in the work. And the idea of this apocalypse being like a moment for transformation. And that's often like how that manifests in actual societies too. There's a moment in the story where it's talked about how, you know, you had this 2000 year reign of these prophets and then you know that previous to them, there is an older religion that worshipped a creation god. And when it gets spoken of now, if people are conscious of its existence, because there are still temples that are decrepit and empty around the world, but nobody actually worshipping them. And I thought it was a really interesting thing to note that you're like, oh, yeah, this used to be there. Nobody cares about it now. But it was a building block of our world. And now we've had 2000 years of this other solidified thing. And now that they've been gone for a little bit, now we're changing again. And it is very much that idea of culture and religion and the things that hold us together kind of move in a wheel. And we're constantly either on that uptick of like, everything's great and we're moving to your yeah. utopia or, oh, we're headed right into apocalypse. Yeah. Yeah. And I feel like often in fantasy books, there is an element that is like, here's sort of how the old world works. And now we are like this and it's different. And you don't necessarily see that like, actually the old way that things works was also once a new way that the world works. And that's something that I think I really wanted to look at because I love history. I studied history. And in my studies of history, I was always seeing ways in which there were these pockets of history with like a lot of progress and like things suddenly changing. And we think of that as being like, oh, that's the past. The past is static and the future is progress. And it's really not like that at all. When you're building a large history like this and then figuring out how to introduce its elements to the audience in a way that will inform the story without bogging them down, I want to know how, like, how you approach that from a standpoint of pacing. But I also want to know just how your world construction was working. Because there are some writers who sit down and world build and world build and world build until they've got this huge backlog. And they're like, OK, now we're ready to tell a story. Yeah. And then other people sit down and just start writing the story. And then they're like, oh, I need some history. And they start figuring out from there. And then there's, you know, there's a lot of different spaces in between. So I want to know, first off, how was that for you? Like, were you building it big and then going to the story the other way around? Or how did that happen? Yeah, so I think the way in which I built the world and the way in which it is sort of disseminated into the narrative was the single most, the thing that I worked the most on throughout revising this book. And so when I started writing it, the very first draft, there's really not a ton of world building in it. Um, there are sort of, again, like the central concept of these graces. And I knew it was sort of a Mediterranean-ish world. And that was basically it. And I sort of wrote the first draft just knowing those things and trying to build as I wrote. And then the process of world building took place after I had the first draft. And I was like, I think that there's a lot more here. And I sort of mentioned all these history things that I just like threw in there. <laughs> so let me figure out what they actually all are, how this world is set up. Um, what these different locations that I keep mentioning are. And all of that really took a long time. But it was, again, after I had already had the narrative down and I knew basically what was happening in the book and with these characters. And that was a fun process. It was also a very difficult process. Um, and I think in terms of like putting it into the book and pacing, that was really difficult too, because I really tried to make it so that 
you know that there's this long history, you know that there's sort of all of this stuff about the world that you could explore and know more about. But I really only want to tell readers the things that are really relevant to like what's happening to the characters and what's happening in the plot. And so balancing that was like, just a constant juggling act. And when I would change a storyline, I would change, you know, the sort of world building that went along with it. And so that was definitely like the longest revision process that I had. You mentioned earlier that you were originally querying this directly as fantasy and not as YA. I'm going to guess that maybe that it got sold as YA then, like somebody picked it up and said, yeah. okay, I think we can move it this way. That means that your your thinking process as far as audience was different in the original construction versus where it was being brought to. So was there a point in the editing process then where they were like, okay, we need to make some changes to this to make it more accessible to this audience? And if there were, what were those changes? Yeah, so it was really my agent was the one who, when we signed, she was like, if we're going to sign, I think you should know, like, I think this is a YA book and I want to sell it as YA. Um, we did end up going out to adult and YA imprints, publishing imprints, but it did eventually sell to a YA. And I think I think she was right that it was truly a YA book. And even as I was writing it, I was writing it as a fantasy book, not necessarily trying to differentiate between young adult and adult. And so the book itself, I think, for the most part, really did read as YA, even at that point. It was just that I didn't necessarily see a place in the that current YA market for it. There were certainly things that I did clarify um, make less complicated. But I think like, ultimately, those things weren't because we were making the book YA, it was just making the book better. <laughs> so for instance, like there was this whole subplot um, that has to do with the prince and his sort of situation in this new city that he's been exiled to. And I was had the subplot in for a really long time. And we sort of realized like, there's too much political stuff in this. This isn't a political fantasy. Like, it's about a prophecy. It's about these characters. It's not about necessarily like, the politics of this particular city. So I took all of that stuff out. I really clarified a lot of the world building. And I think the book is better for it, not just, you know, more YA. How do you make those decisions as far as, you know, how much information to give? And like, I mean, I don't know if this is a beta reader thing or if your editor you know, gives you some input on this, but I always think about this when you've got complex world building. We know that YA audiences, whether they are young adults or we know there's lots of adults who read YA, but they tend to be pretty vocal about the fact that they like to have the emotional core out front and center and they want – expository elements to not bog down storytelling. You know, pacing seems to be like a real big demand of that audience is they want things that move. And this does. I mean, I think that that's one of the big differences where it's like, if this was your traditional epic fantasy story, like a Robert Jordan-esque kind of thing, it would have taken 85 novels to get to where this <laughs> book does in 200 pages. You know, you don't wait around to get these characters put together. And and I found it really refreshing. But I also, I just got to think that like with that much complexity going on there, that there are beats that you have to pull out. And you've already kind of addressed that a little bit, but I'm really curious as to like, if you did get beta reader response or anything where there were, this is too confusing or this is too much, or maybe I'm missing something. Like where, where do you balance those things out? Most of my beta readers were asking either to clarify world things, which made sense because there were a lot of things that I just like straight up did not know myself and so had to figure out. I actually feel like I got a lot of reader responses that were like, I, we need more information. We need to like just lay this out for us, particularly from my agent and also from my sister, who is like my first and foremost beta reader of everything I write. Um, she's always constantly writing like, I want to know more about this. If I'll like vaguely mention something, she'll be like, I literally want to know everything about this. Um, and obviously there's a balance to that. I can't go into detail about every little thing that's in the book. But I think in terms of pacing, like that's something that like I just sort of inherently know what good pacing feels like, which is not to say that my first drafts have amazing pacing. They don't. But as I'm going through, like, that's something that I'm always sort of attuned to, knowing, like, at what moments the story really needs to pick up, at what moments it's okay to sort of, like, take a rest, you know, have some more introspective moments or some more world building moments. And that's something I'm, like, constantly working on as I'm revising. No matter what I'm really doing, I'm figuring out, like, how can this be more efficient? How can this plot point come with a better bang so that like the readers get more excited to continue reading? And I think that's just something that's sort of inherent to my kind of writing. There's a number of moments as these characters start to kind of collide where we'll see the chapters kind of shorten up a little bit and kind of bounce back and forth between their perspectives. It gives you a, a lot more fleshed out idea of the scenes and seeing them from those different perspectives. How are you making those choices? Were you specifically like, I want to 
quicken up the pace here with these shorter chapters and flipping them around? Was it just sort of a natural choice as you were getting into them? Or was that like a really refined process to figure out how to make that flow? It was definitely a process that took a little time to figure out, but I think a lot of it was just sort of natural storytelling instinct. Like, okay, this needs to be from this person's point of view um, because we really need to see like their sort of emotional state while this is happening. But then this next part needs to be from the next person's point of view. And I think with this book in particular, I actually didn't outline it, which was difficult, but I think it would have been pretty hard to outline because there's so many moments when these characters cross paths and then they sort of separate and then they'll cross paths with a new character. And so lining up all of those moments and figuring out what point of view each of those moments is going to take place in was like a super just like organic process that I couldn't have really outlined, I don't think. That sounds terrifying to me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> like going into something that has this much character complexity, like without a roadmap. So then how did you how did you manage all that stuff then? I mean, were you writing it linear or what was your methodology? I was writing it pretty linear. I think there were a few times when I would sort of just like skip ahead in a certain person's perspective. Um, and then go back. But I sort of had these like placeholder chapters where I was like, okay, I know something else is happening here for this other character, but I'm just going to like speed ahead with this one because I'm, you know, super into the storyline or whatever. So I definitely wrote it like pretty linearly, I think. What were the tools you were using then? Because you've got all this detail to keep track of. There's all this world building. And I imagine there's a lot more that we don't see on the page, both from the standpoint of just you doing the work and also because I believe this is the first book in a series, right? So yes, it's a trilogy. Yeah. There's pl plenty more to come. So where are you tracking all that stuff? And then how are you making sure that the stuff that actually appears in the manuscript stays matched up with the most current version of, of your world building? <laughs> Um, so I use Scrivener to write in, which I find very helpful because you can just kind of have any notes that you need right there in the same, you know, window. I think if I had tried to write this book in like Word or something like Google Docs, like I would not have been able to do it. I think I only was able to write this book because of Scrivener. <laughs> and like, it just basically meant a lot of color coding, a lot of like going back through things. And to be honest, like not all of my world building documents are updated. Like a lot of them are just sort of like outdated and I would change things as I went and not really go back and fix them. So that's something I might want to do like as I'm going forward with books two and three to make sure that I have like the correct information. But yeah, I think Scrivener definitely is a great tool for any sort of writing, but especially a novel like this. When you have a story that has a particular strong magic system, and I, I mean, it feels weird to say magic system since it's not presented as magic in this world, but with the graces, did you run into any point in the writing where you found that you maybe made the powers too strong or they affected the mechanics of your world in a way that created problems? I mean, I've talked with a number of writers who have had points where they're like, oh, I got to walk this back. Because once I introduce this element, then 10 other things become problematic. So I have to go in and make that fix. So did you ever have that moment with the graces? I don't think that I really did because the graces, the way that they work, I don't think any one of them is particularly overpowered. Perhaps the grace of blood, which allows you to like kill someone by just touching them. But I had sort of built into the world that there's different gradients to, you know, the power that each person who possesses these graces will have. So not everyone can actually do that. So yeah, I think if anything, like, sometimes there were times that I was like, I need to figure out how this character is going to get out of this situation. And like, I, you know, they're not really powerful enough in the magic sense to just sort of magic their way out of it. So I think, yeah, the graces themselves didn't really present any particular big plot issues. I think it was more just keeping them consistent with one another and making sense within the confines of the world. I liked that the people who have the grace of heart, they have to actually uh, – there was a very sort of – to me, it struck me as a very Tai Chi-ish element to them being able to access – that power. So like, it's not like they just walk around like super strength, super powered all the time. They actually have to kind of use these things. So I think they're called koas. Yeah. Yeah. So the koas are basically like the forms that they use to access those abilities and to do the empowered thing. So they have some enhanced senses that are always working, but when they're actually in combat, they have to mindfully choose to use these things that empower them. So I like that the, you had some mechanics built in for all of the characters that there were there were things they had to do. And a few of the characters have some trade-offs as well. Like one of the characters, Anton, has a kind of a taint to his ability. So, I mean, I guess that's kind of a good segue to kind of talk about the characters. You have a, a broadcast here, but you have five core POV characters. You talked about them earlier on. 
sort of like the book blurb kind of version of what each one of them are. <laughs> it's really nice because they're all very distinct. They all have very much have their own voice. It's very clear who each one of them are. But I thought it was interesting, too, that it took a little while for you to introduce all of them because a couple of them appear very quickly and we spend some time with them before, like, for instance, the character Jude, I don't think appears until how far? He's in chapter four, but you're right that it's like at least 50 pages into the book. Right. Yeah. It takes a little while before we actually get to him. So like I mentioned, like Anton is this character who has the the grace of sight. He's this interesting mix of a character who has a great deal of swagger and self-dependence because he's been sort of a runaway for like five or six years of his life. But he's also a runaway because he has this great fear in his background. And that fear has an effect on this ability that he has. And, he, and, and so we're told that he has the grace of sight to a nth degree that but the average graced person does not have. And yet he has this thing holding him back. Can you kind of talk a little bit about that? I mean, we don't want to get into spoiler territory, but enough right. that we can kind of get a feel for who he is. Yeah, I love that you brought up Anton because I feel like very often when people read the book and they're asked who their favorite character is, it's often Anton. He's like a very bantery, sort of quick-witted type of character. Um, but he does that have this really intense vulnerability that comes sort of from his past and from his family and his relationship with, I don't think this is too big of a spoiler. <laughs> so his relationship with his brother. Um, and that was actually one of the first relationships that I had figured out in my brain when I first started brainstorming this story was this relationship between Anton and his brother, um, which is really a toxic, awful, abusive relationship. Um, but I found to be so interesting. And I think with Anton and with really most of the male characters in this book, and there are quite a lot, there's three point of view characters who are male, especially for a YA audience, but really for anyone. I'm always trying to write boys who have that sort of vulnerability to them. Um, because I think that a lot of times boys really feel like they can't show weakness and they can't show that vulnerable side. Um, and so I always want to write characters who do have that and yet also have like a lot of strengths to them. So I think that dichotomy is important. I think the it's sort of a, a complete opposite from, from Anton is Hassan. So Hassan is a prince in exile. He's had to flee his homeland and we've and and all that's happened basically just before the story starts. And he is already sitting in his aunt's villa and he's comfortable. He's not like on the run per se, but he is hiding out and pretend essentially pretending to be somebody else for a little while before he can find out what's happened in his home city. And so we have Hassan who is experiencing the life of these other refugees going and visiting them and seeing the situation they're in and seeing things get worse. And you, you mentioned like Anton's the snarky one-liner character, you know, the character who's kind of fun to watch because he gets mouthy with people. <laughs> Hassan is careful about his words, is a little less impulsive, clearly deeply empathetic. And so he's trying to run toward the problem of the things yes. that are happening versus Anton, who's always running away. So you have this very yeah. different polar opposite with them. Um, I will also note that early on, Hassan encounters this other character who is a legionnaire and a, and a graced legionnaire. And I will say that the, for me, and this is a very common thing for a lot of readers, but not for me, the idea of like immediately shipping somebody where you're like, <laughs> oh, like, oh, I'm into that. I, like, yeah. I'm not generally geared that way. I don't have the like, oh, I ship this. But the moment that Hassan meets this Legionnaire character, the moment those two characters together, I was like, oh, oh, gosh, this is what this feels like. <laughs> I, I ship it. <laughs> so I, I, I had a lot of fun with that. Wonderful to hear. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, it worked immediately for me and I was into that dynamic a lot. I mean, can you kind of expand a little bit on Hassan, uh, particularly from the standpoint of having a royal character? Because you know, there's a lot of princes and princesses in fantasy and sometimes it's really tropey. And I think Hassan moves pretty far away from some of those tropes. So, like, how did you construct him? I mean, I love prince characters. I love, you know, royals, whatever. Always into it. Um, I think Hassan particularly is interesting because although he is sort of has this birthright and he's born into, you know, this family and he's the only heir um, to the throne, he really doesn't feel worthy of it because he's from this family that's been graced. And there's actually a prophecy about his family. And so he feels like if he takes power, he believes he's not graced. He thinks that he's sort of going to somehow mess it up. And the fact that his city has been taken over sort of confirms this fear for him. So throughout the book, he's sort of trying to figure out, you know, is he going to be worthy of being leader of this country, especially when it is in such a dire situation? And so I did love writing him. And Capri is the name of the legionnaire, particularly just this dynamic of Hassan is a prince. He's also a nerd. 
Um, he's sort of an indoor kid. He knows how to fight a little bit because his mother was this really talented swordswoman. And so when he meets Kepri, she's basically the definition of a jock, <laughs> um, but in a fantasy setting. Um, she's a soldier. She has these two older brothers. She's grown up and become this really like talented swordswoman. And so that dynamic of like this nerdy prince boy and this very powerful, strong woman, I loved that dynamic. I felt like that was a little different from a lot of the couples that you see. <laughs> Well, I love that there's a scene where she has no idea who he is because he's misrepresenting himself to keep a low profile, but she kind of mouths off to him a couple of times playfully, but still like giving him orders as she's having him help out in the community. And Hassan has this reaction of like, nobody has ever spoken to him like that before because he is a prince. And he finds it kind of exciting to have somebody who is like, who will speak to him in this way. And it's not, you know, speaking down to him, but is very direct and presenting themselves as an equal. And he's, he's into it. Like you said, he's, yeah. a, he's a total Ravenclaw, right? <laughs> yeah. And so I, I really like that dynamic a lot. And I really enjoy those characters whenever they're on screen on page. And then you have, so Afira and Beru are the sisters. Yes. Afira is our first POV character, and she is also what's referred to in this world as the Pale Hand, because she has the grace of blood, and she's been using it to kill people in order to, in turn, heal her sister, who has this mysterious malady that they cannot quite cure, but that they can hold at bay. With Afira, what I think is you've got a character who is who is increasingly someone who doesn't like the fact that she has to kill but maybe doesn't feel that bad about it anymore and is becoming increasingly sort mm -hmm. of pragmatic about the use of this in order to save her sister whereas her sister is carrying a great deal of guilt about this and wishes that they were doing something more humane or a little bit more i don't know lawful good if you want to get D, &D about it <laughs> so building out those characters then and, and then producing in, in this world like you've got sisters who have a an aligned mission to keep the younger sister alive but obviously feel very different about it and you've got that older sister who i mean is essentially a reluctant assassin so different kind of character to introduce in the beginning of this so what were you doing to make those characters work on the page and and make that sisterhood feel real and make people go oh yeah i would definitely kill to keep her alive <laughs> That was one of my favorite relationships to write as well. And it really did come from the fact that I have an older sister who I'm very close with and who, you know, if I needed to, I would probably kill people for her. Like if I had to. <laughs> um, so I just wanted to write a relationship between two sisters where they would move heaven and earth if heaven existed in this world for one another um, and have that relationship be, you know, as important or more important than any romantic relationship in the book. Um, I love writing about siblings. Obviously, I have two sets of them in the book. For me, yeah, I think one of the challenges was writing that relationship in a way where you really felt not just that they loved one another, but that they know each other in this way that really only like two sisters who are that close can know each other. And there's all these sort of little things, silent communications that they have with one another, ways that like these two people know each other better than anyone else in the world. And that was hard because that's such a specific relationship. You know, it's not overt. I love you. I love you too. It's all of these tiny little moments. So seeding that into this book was sort of a challenge, but also very fun and rewarding. I really like that you mentioned that you have two pairs of siblings in this because I think I've even seen people kind of talking about this like on Twitter and in the writer community lately, but how often like fantasy and sci-fi seem to kind of treat everybody as an only child, that there's <laughs> there's a lot of characters running around where like they might have some sort of like familial background that's hinted at, but oftentimes those siblings right. play no big role in their life. Right. As a, re as a person and as a reader, like I'm the last of 15 kids. The youngest of 15. 15? Yeah, yeah. That's a whole complicated other story. But yes, I have 10 sisters and four <laughs> brothers. And yet I, in a lot of ways, stand alone from them in a lot of ways. Like I'm separated by a number of years and they are not a part of my day-to-day -day life in the same way that they are for each other. For them, they have all those things you're talking about. Intense history, intense experiences together that have forged them into, I don't know, like a shared vernacular. You know, you see yes, them in a room together. Yes. There's a lot of subtext that the average person has no idea what's going on, but they have it with each other. 
Yeah. And that I don't, I don't share with them. So it's weird. I, I can sit and look at it and know it for what it is because I know they're my siblings and I could recognize it, but I don't necessarily speak that language. So I did think that really sold on the page with the sisters in this as far as seeing that they have their own language and that complicated backstory because they spend every day together and pretty much alone. You know, they're very isolated. Yeah, they really don't have anyone else. So they depend on each other in many, many ways. And that almost always introduces some level of love hate, right? Because you can only spend that much time completely isolated with somebody before as much as you adore them, they start to tick you off. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's sort of like the very standard sibling relationship. You love them more than anyone, but there's also times when you can't stand them. (laughs) And so I think that was definitely another thing that I wanted to show in the sibling relationship and particularly between two sisters because we sometimes see sister relationships in fantasy and it often takes the form of like the older sister is sort of a mother figure to the younger sister or something like that. And I wanted to show that, yes, you know, they have to take care of one another, but there's more to that relationship. And then the last POV character is Jude, who is a young guy who's about to have a tremendous amounts of of responsibility thrown on top of him because he is sort of like the chosen heir apparent to the leadership of this order of people who have are devoted to the prophets and their prophecy who have been hiding away for generations because the world thinks they're dead they think they're gone and who you know reemerge as part of these things that are happening but he's he's a young guy who's put into this position where there's a lot of responsibility on him but he's also deeply compromised by his relationship with his closest friend And again, was something that I thought like I hadn't really seen anybody for a while kind of approach this kind of character dynamic. You do a pretty clear job of selling early on when Jude comes in. You're like, this is a fine, upstanding young man who's going to try his (laughs) his best and like, oh, no, he's going to make some bad choices. Oh, goodness. (laughs) It's right there. And, you know, as soon as you know him, you're like, oh, oh, poor Jude. Oh, poor Jude. (laughs) talk about Jude for like an hour if you want. Um. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I do kind of want to know like, you know, what we were thinking about when you're constructing him because you have a character who he's in a position where he's not really allowed to have any kind of attachment at all. Yeah. Because family isn't a thing to his order. They only have their purpose. And here he is with romantic feelings towards his honestly very problematic best friend. <laughs> and Hector, his best friend, has some big time ulterior motives that don't necessarily involve those same kinds of reciprocal feelings. Uh, Yeah. And so what you have is a hot mess of characters making choices that put them in conflict with each other. So in constructing that, like you have so much complexity going on with all these other characters. And then Jude has this deeply emotional, you know, situation going on. So how do you balance that out? Yeah. um, I mean, I loved writing Jude. I think of all the characters, he is sort of the most emotive and he thinks on his emotions a lot because he's someone who really wants to do what's expected of him and wants to do his best to, you know, take on this really huge responsibility. And he thinks that any doubts that he has about being able to do that, any wavering in his devotion to that, any attention that he spends elsewhere means that he's like not going to be able to do it. So he's someone who puts an intense amount of pressure on himself and ultimately, you know, crumbles because of it. And I think, A of all, that's very relatable, I think, for especially people of my generation, probably other generations too, um, when you're young and you really, you know, want to do what you think is expected of you. And I think also all of the other characters, I think, have these sort of really tragic backstories to them. And Jude, while his backstory isn't tragic at all, he sort of lives in a situation where he hasn't experienced a lot of love or affection. You know, he cares for and is cared for by the people in his order. He's very comfortable there. But there's really no sort of overt affection. Um, And I think that is really damaging to a person. You know, he wants that so much, but he also thinks he shouldn't want it. So, yeah, it was definitely an interesting and like a fun character to write. Anybody who has had a great deal of expectation placed on them anywhere in their life, particularly when they were young, has had those moments where they've had to stop and be like, but what do I want? Yeah, exactly. Jude is, like you said, he's not maladjusted, but he he definitely has a great deal to work out um, that he's only sort of coming to grips with in the midst of a very tumultuous time in his people's history. It's a bad moment to be emotionally conflicted, right? <laughs> but it's exactly. but he has no choice in the matter. It's just the way that things kind of come together. 
when you're contrasting those POVs and putting them together, I mean, we kind of talked about how they they really do have kind of a, a lot of different directions they're going in. When you were first putting them together, did you have characters that you discovered when you were writing them that they like they just sparked on page more than you expected, or maybe they didn't? Maybe they maybe you found that you had to rework things to to make them work together. I mean, were there surprising moments in your own writing process for that? And if there were problems, how did you fix them? Yeah, I mean, I always love those moments in a book where like two characters cross paths. So I was always writing towards those moments. Um, and there's definitely some notable ones. This is early in the book, so not really a spoiler. But like when Ephira shows up, um, basically like in Anton's bedroom, and she's like this notorious murderer, I really loved writing that moment. Um, I love the moment when, you know, Jude and Hassan come into contact. Um, I think the two characters whose sort of dynamic surprised me the most um, was Beru and Hector, who, as we already talked about, is like a member of this order and is Jude's friend. Um, And without being too spoilery, as soon as I had them on the page together, and it really doesn't happen until probably maybe halfway into the book, I was like, oh, this is a really interesting dynamic. And the way that their conversation kind of went really surprised me. There's sort of so many emotions involved in their sort of experience together. (laughs) Again, trying not to do spoilers. (laughs) Um, And the way that those emotions came out was different than I expected. And so writing those scenes was just like, I mean, kind of cheesy, but like lightning on the page. I was like, wow, like, this is great. (laughs) And as for issues that I had of characters coming into contact with one another, um, I don't really think that I had any. (laughs) I'm like trying to think. No, I mean, mostly it's just really fun. I think when you're a reader and you like know these two characters so well individually and then they meet each other, I always love that moment. We talked about earlier that like you didn't outline on this. Did you have any kind of specific plotting system or or process that you were thinking about as you were constructing it? And by that, I mean, whether it's three act structure, four act, save the cat, story circle, whatever kind of beats. I mean, there's uh, there's lots of other kind of features out there. Um, Were any of those kind of in your head while you were putting it together? I think a really general three act structure was in my head. And this is sort of just like my storytelling instinct at this point, because my dad is a screenwriter. And he used to teach screenwriting. And we talk about story all the time. So those sort of like basics have been ingrained in me for such a long time that as I'm writing, I just sort of know like where the story needs to go and like how it's shaped. He like used to do this thing when we would watch movies, he still does this, actually, he'll like put this the like time of the movie, he'll like pause it so we can see what time it is when certain plot points happen. And he'll be like, Oh, inciting incident, we're eight minutes into the movie, (laughs) like stuff like that. So that sort of like general structure is just something that I know, like back and front, um, and is in my head when I'm drafting stuff, but I don't really use those sort of traditional plot beats beyond like, I know there needs to be an inciting incident, and like a midpoint and a climactic scene. And then I just sort of go from there. And you mentioned, too, that you are a Scrivener user. Is there anything outside of that that are part of your writing tools? Do you do anything by hand, stick up any post-its, any of that kind of stuff? Yeah, I have a notebook that I use to brainstorm and to just sort of jot things down and, you know, plan things out. I actually use it a lot for, like, when I'm doing revisions, I'll make, like, a checklist of, like, all the things I want to get done that week. So I can, like, have this very visual way to check that off. And that's very satisfying. (laughs) And then as we finish up here, I want to know what other stories and media are you putting into your head right now? This is the first book in a trilogy, um, and you started working on it a while ago, so I'd imagine that you're working on those sequels. But while you're doing that, what other stuff are you consuming, whether it's books or film or TV or podcasts or anything? Yeah, all of the above. I listen to a lot of these sort of interview with writers podcasts, which I always find very inspiring to hear how other people construct their stories and come up with stuff. I am reading a lot of 2019 releases. So people in my same like debut group. So for instance, I have read uh, Wicked Fox by Kat Cho, which was super awesome. The Merciful Crow by Margaret Owen, who I'm going on tour with this fall. So that will be exciting. I do watch a lot of TV, not as much as I used to. um, But I tend to sort of just kind of rewatch things. So I recently rewatched like all of Veronica Mars so I could watch the new season, um, which was great. I do get a lot of inspiration from stuff that's not necessarily science fiction and fantasy, because I think I try to write science fiction and fantasy that is super character focused. I can get that kind of inspiration from almost anything where I'm like, that's a really interesting person. (laughs) Um, And I think Veronica Mars is a great example of like, it's just a really interesting protagonist. I'm watching the last season of Jane the Virgin, which is a great show that I think 
it's not the type of show that I would be like, oh yeah, I'm totally going to watch that. But I did watch it and it's so intensely high concept and kind of ridiculous. Like the concept is like she gets artificially inseminated by accident and like has this kid. But they take that high concept and they infuse it with like such good character and like they're so consistent and the character growth is so earned. Like all of those character moments just like feel so real. So I love that they managed to like do that. (laughs) So yeah, I've taken inspiration from almost anything. Katie, how should people be finding you online to keep following you? Because I think this is going to be a big release. I think with um, Fierce Reads always pushes hard with new stuff. From the standpoint of just marketing, this is a clearly marketable novel, I think, that will definitely hit audiences in a big way. So as you're working on the next project, you said you're going on tour to promote the book with other authors and stuff. Where should people be following you online in order to keep track of your adventures and shenanigans in the world of writing? (laughs) Um, so I have a Twitter. It's at Katie Pool, K-A-T-Y, pool like a swimming pool. And I do have an Instagram, which I am like more and more active on. Um, and that's at Katie Rose Pool, same spellings. Um, and I also have a website, which is katierosepool.com. And you can sign up for my newsletter there, which also is like always has all of the news, all of the event information in it. So as I mentioned at the top, There Will Come a Darkness arrives uh, September 3rd. It's a Fierce Reads title. Um, I saw a number of the packaging things that went out to libraries and other places and stuff too that had some like really cool like character cards and stuff and whatever that looked really awesome. So there's a really neat campaign going on. Um, I expect this to really grab a lot of people's imaginations. This is a really fantastic story. Um, I really enjoyed it. Um, so you. I th- I think people will be into this. So I hope everybody checks this story out and then Katie, thank you for joining me on Fictitious. Thank you for having me. This has been Season 4, Episode 6 of Fictitious. All episodes of the show are available at fictitiouspodcast.com, along with news and events, articles, and book reviews. Listen and subscribe to Fictitious on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, and Spotify, or search for the show using your favorite app. Stay connected to All Things Fictitious on Twitter or Instagram, where you'll find us as at FictitiousPod. You can also chat about books, fandom, and other nerdy stuff directly with me on my personal account, at Adrian Buskey. If you like the program, please share Fictitious on social media, tell your friends, or write us a review. All those things support the authors who appear on the show, and you'll help me to grow the podcast. Next week, author and newly minted Hugo Award winner Alex E. Harrow discusses her debut fantasy novel, The Ten Thousand Doors of January. Subscribe now so you don't miss it. I'm Adrian Buskey. Thanks for listening to Fictitious. (laughs) 